Well, good afternoon, everybody. If you'll take your Bibles and open to the book of Mark, chapter 7, we're going to once again take a look at our Lord in his challenge to the Pharisees. Um, as a reminder, back in um, October 29th, I began this new section, really, uh, confrontation of the Lord with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the message, I called it, cleanliness is next to godliness. But the thesis was, we need to understand the accusation which the Pharisees and the scribes are making so that we ourselves don't fall into the same trap. And I call that trap thinking that the law of cleansing was the cleansing itself. It's the idea that we could actually keep the law. So today, we're going to examine Christ's response to their question. Seems like uh, just in the past few weeks since, since I've uh, last preached until now, there's been a, a, a lot of... Um, there's this fellow... I, I don't know the guy. I, I just seen the name numerous times all over. Uh, Cain West or something like this. Kine is his? Yeah. Uh, become a Christian, and uh, he's a celebrity person. Um, and I won't call his faith into question in any sense. But it's a public proclamation. It was something that that was made, and it made all kinds of news. Right? This, there's a lot of uh, talk in the blogosphere about this. It's, it's in vogue today, though, isn't it? Publicly claiming Christ. When I was a kid, I don't know anybody in particular that made a big deal about being a Christian. In fact, you got the impression that you didn't talk about it. Maybe that was where I grew up in the North Woods. It was a, hard, a little harder area than this area, okay? Um, but up there, people are pretty rough and on the edge, you know? Uh, but I, I didn't even hear of Christian movies back then. I think there was a movie, and I, I'm sure my brother uh, Gordon would know the name, but I can't think of it right now. It's, a, it's an old film strip they used to play in the 70s, about, uh, and it was kind of dispensational about the, the left-behind type thinking. I don't know what the name of the movie was, you know, Fire or something. And that was the closest thing to a Christian movie I remember. Um, and, and I, I remember thinking that's more of a horror movie. I watched it. I, I, some, some Assemblies of God church was, had it, and they, they promoted it, so a bunch of us kids went there. And I didn't understand what they were talking about. It was just, it was, but it almost seemed like a horror flick with the craziness in this, in this movie. Um, but I, I would tell you, the modern era has blessed us with some good Christian movies. There's... there's a, um, the Hendrick Brothers and their whole series of films. I think there's six of them now. Um, the, 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 the big one that first came out, uh, we, we all probably remember right away, was Fireproof with uh, Kirk Cameron, actually a notable movie star in it. And Cameron is known to be a Christian. Kind of interesting. Uh, most of the stars and actresses in that movie and in all the other movies are really just ordinary Joes from the church in, I want to say, Georgia, that, that, that sponsors their filmmaking. But I was also surprised as I was uh, thinking about these things. I thought, let me just Google actors and actresses who are Christians. And, of course, you get all kinds of weird things when you Google. But it, when I, when I kind of dug through it, here's some big names that might have an, a, a valid claim of Christ here. Chuck Norris. I had no idea. I, I, maybe there's something to that. I didn't know. Uh, Mark Wahlberg, Carrie Underwood, Denzel Washington, which really surprised me. I, I had no idea. Uh, apparently his father's even a, a minister. Chris Pratt, uh, Kathy Lee Gifford. There's a lot of names out there. Um, some of those names I don't hardly know, okay? But uh, some of them I know fairly well, um, and I bring these, these people up not to comment or question on their faith, but they are public people, and they have stated that they are Christians, just like we do, don't we? We don't have the same platform, but not only are they public people who, who claim to be Christians, but the, the very nature of what they do uh, as actors and actresses 
um, kind of comes into play here in, in today's sermon. Um, the if you if you look at some of these people, some of them you may say, oh, I think they're hypocrites. I don't think their faith is real, right? And it may be a valid, it may be true that their faith is not real. Well, what do we call? What is a hypocrite? It's someone who play acts, who's an actor or an actress of the faith. They say one thing, but they are actually another. This this word hypocrite actually got started um, in the old Greece um, uh, Greece plays, and they would put masks on. And these masks weren't just to hide the identity of the person who is acting, but it was also to do much like our microphone. It would amplify their voice. And so that, that, that act of amplification was, uh, they, they called it um, to say again or to say loudly. And, and that, that, that uh, term became the word hypocrite. It, 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 that's the, the etymology of it. And I'm not really giving a very good history of it, but it, but it kind of, you can see where things have come from there. But Christ, in our sermon today, calls the Pharisees and the scribes hypocrites. It's a warning for all of us. The warning against hypocrisy points to a heart problem, a problem that we also have to fear and be concerned about. It tells us, guard your heart. But it doesn't just say guard your heart. It says guard it properly. So let's let's examine the text. If you've got Mark chapter 7 there in front of you, I'm going to read uh, verses 5 to 13. Verses 5 to 13. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with unwashed hands? And he answered and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. And he said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep Your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, If a man says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, that is, give a gift to God, and then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down. And many such things you do. So, uh, as I like to do is examine that text. I, I have two things I'd like to bring before you. First is verse 7. Take a look at verse 7. It's in the New King James, it says, And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And I struggled with how that ought to be translated. I, I went through the, the Greek. I went back and forth. Of course, it's, it's uh, a quotation from the, um, the Old Testament, too. So, you, you know, you could kind of take a look at that and try to see. But after I looked at many different translations, uh, honestly, I, I chose a translation which I usually don't choose, um, the Net Bible. It's, it's not so much one of those... Uh, word-by-word translations, but I believe it gets it perfectly this time. Listen to the way they do it. and it's, it's not much different than what I already read. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. Now, did you catch the difference? You probably didn't. They took away the plural. Now, the plural is actually there. Teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. But I believe that... By removing the plural, it holds better the actual intent of what is being talked about. We're talking about an entire body of doctrine, not just an individual teaching here or there. The NASB, um, I like the way they handled um, 
some of the, the word differences they use. Uh, but in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. But the reason this is kind of uh, in, in, important to understand, we're talking about a body of doctrine, is because the body of doctrine that Jesus is referencing here is something we don't often run across in our Christian circles, okay? It's called the Mishnah. We're talking about Jewish terms. And this Mishnah, what is that? So I'm going to explain that in a moment. Secondly, there's this word Corbin. And and I looked at it, and that took a long time to kind of figure out where this is coming from. What is this word, Corbin? And of course, Mark tells us, which is a good thing, because if Mark doesn't tell us, we got nothing, folks. There's no place in all of the Greek or the Hebrew in any form which this word is used. So if you were to look, it's not there, except in this one instance. And there's no ancient sources for it at all. But I, I discovered there was a reference to it in the Aramaic, the Aramaic form. In, in what's called a targum. And so when you look at the Aramaic version of the Old Testament, which is Ar- Aramaic is basically a very similar language to Hebrew, uses a similar character step, but the words are different. That word, korban, means offering. And you find it um, first with the uh, in Genesis uh, chapter 4 with the offering of Cain and Abel. It's referenced twice there. And then you see it numerous times in Leviticus and in Numbers. Um, so Mark got it right, which we don't have to question, right? But it's good. We're to study, our, study to show ourselves approved unto God. Where did this word come from? Well, now you have an answer. It's important. It's important to understand that. I I want you to have an answer when somebody comes to you and says, what's this mean? It might be kind of a small technical thing. And I know we uh, mentioned earlier, we live in a world of polemics, but we should have an answer if we can. But I mentioned the Mishnah. So let's define our terms. What is this thing called the Mishnah? The Mishnah, according to the Jewish Virtual Library.org, is the collection of rabbinic traditions redacted by Rabbi Judah Hanasi, usually called simply the rabbi, at the beginning of the 3rd century CE. The Mishnah supplements, complements, clarifies, and systematizes the commandments of the Torah. Now, normally I don't like using the, the, the... the, the annual reference uh, CE, which is you, you, we prefer AD in the year of our Lord, Anno Don, Domino, um, which is Latin. And the modern way of putting it is uh, in the common era. And I think the Jews like to do that because that way they don't have to give uh, any nod to our Lord at all. So they do that, right? But I, you know. But I thought that was interesting, the Mishnah. It's, called, it's a rabbinic traditions. But we have more. The Mishnah is only the beginning. We have something called the Talmud. What's that? The Talmud is a generic term for the documents that comment and expand upon the Mishnah. The first work of the rabbinic law. Published around 200 CE, once again they say, right, by Rabbi Judah, the patriarch, in the land of Israel. So now we've got a document that's commenting on the traditions that are explained from the law. So how, how, how many generations are removed are we now from the actual word of God, right? It's not done yet. We've got something called the Midrash. What's that? The Midrash, you're going to like this at first. This is coming from myjewishlearning.com. The Midrash is an interpretive act seeking, to, and to, seeking the answers to religious questions, both practical and theological, by plumbing the, words, the, or the, plumbing the meaning of the words of the Torah. Ah, we say, ah, finally, we got something to grab onto. Then they add this. 
It is often difficult to determine simply from reading the Bible text what Jewish law would be in practice. The text of the Torah is often general and ambiguous when presenting laws. Midrash Halakha attempts to clarify or extend a law beyond the conditions assumed in the Bible and to make connections between current practice and the biblical text. I hope you're beginning to have synopses firing in your head saying, wait a minute, the traditions, the, the, these things that are piling upon each other, and you're probably thinking of some of the things that the Lord said, aren't you? So let's look at this. We, we've, we've kind of exa- examined the, the terms, but here's the theological argument. These are the modern Jew, Jew, Jewish terms, but was it really as bad as this? I mean, these things came from the, you know, this is modern terminology, right? They say they were collected in two or 300 A.D., but is it really as bad as that? I mean, this 200 years removed at least. Listen to this. Um, uh, I use one, one of my sources is a, a book by J. Dwight Pentecost. Um, he is dispensational, but this source is a commendable source. It's the words and works of Jesus Christ. It's an excellent resource. And this is one, what, one thing that uh, was commented in his book. The Sadducees were once remarking in derision of the Pharisees that when the Pharisee washed a golden candlestick in the temples, they soon would think that it was necessary to wash the sun. In other words, they they were so much about the, the ritual, weren't they? But listen to what the Talmud actually says. My son, give more heed to the words of the rabbis than to the words of the law. Really? That's what it said. It's, it's pretty shocking. And he, he says, furthermore, it's been argued that the attitude of Judaism toward the, or, their oral law has been the deciding factor in the use of tradition in the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, it kind of makes sense, isn't it? But this, this warning against hypocrisy, it points to a heart problem. And we need to get, do a little heart surgery, don't we? Um, it's a problem we are prone to. It says, guard your heart. But it also says, guard it properly, rightly. So, since Jesus quotes from Isaiah 29, let's go and take a look at that passage that he's quoting against the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, I'm sorry, Pharisees and the scribes. It's Isaiah 29 if you want to go there. And I, the whole chapter is, is, uh, is, is a good chapter. We're just going to read verses 9 through 14. Isaiah 29, 9 through 14. The, the chapter begins against the nation and against particularly the city of Jerusalem. But in verse 9, this is what it says. Pause and wonder. Blind yourselves and be blind. They are drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with intoxicating drink. For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, namely the prophets. And he has covered your heads, namely the seers. The whole vision has become to you like a words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one who is literate, saying, read this, please. And he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. Then the book is delivered to another who is illiterate, saying, read this, please. And he says, I'm not literate. Therefore, the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. Therefore, behold, I will again do a mar- marvelous work among this people, a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. See, it's, this chapter is a chapter of woe that Isaiah is prophesying against the nation, and in particular the city. And he's saying, if you don't change your ways, 
this book that you hold up, you're not going to understand it any longer because I'm going to take away the very guides that you should be listening to but you won't listen to. That's what he's saying. Listen to some more verses in, uh, in some other places. In Isaiah 44, They do not know nor understand, for he has shut their eyes so they cannot see, and their hearts so they cannot understand. Listen to Micah, what Micah says, who is a prophet contemporary to Isaiah. Therefore, you shall have night without vision. You shall have darkness without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets, and the day shall be dark for them. See, when Isaiah and Micah wrote, it was almost a hundred years before the Chaldean conquest and captivity, which was the direct result of their not repenting. They had a hundred years to get it right, folks, and they continued to ignore the warnings. Christ called the scribes and the Pharisees hypocrites. Here we're talking about a metaphorical use of hypocrisy, though, isn't it? A dissembler. The the word actually only appears in the Gospels. It's found 15 times in Matthew, once here in Mark, um, and four, four times, I believe, in Luke. And it's always used only by the Lord. Always and only by Him. This is what made it so egregious, though. They had been punished already centuries ago in the captivity for hypocrisy. And now they were at it again. Isaiah's prophecy was just as relevant for the Jews of Jesus' day as it is for the Christians of our day. There's some more verses for us to consider. Isaiah 48. Hear this, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of Israel and have come forth from the wellsprings of Judah, who swear by the name of the Lord and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth or righteousness. Isn't that interesting? That's what that's what the verse the way it ends. So ah I'm a Christian. Well, are you? Are you walking like a Christian? Are you repenting when you've sinned? I mean nobody is perfect, right? We're all going to be found in sin. But do you quickly go to your Lord when you've sinned? Do you quickly make things right? Because that's the way of a Christian. You don't want to grieve your Lord. And it's so easy to get into a pattern because, honestly, who wants to go into the closet and confess your sin? If, if prayer is hard, confession of sin in prayer is the hardest of prayer. You have to humble yourself. And it is, it is very hard to humble. We've got a hundred thousand excuses, don't we? But if you don't, look what happens. You become hardened. And that little sin, which grieved you in the beginning, now doesn't bother you at all. So the next thing, now you sin something much worse. Well, that grieves you because it's a little harder, Right? But you see what happens? It's a step. And each of these steps of sin that isn't repented of gets worse and worse and worse. And pretty soon, you're in danger of the judgment, as it were. Right? This is uh, Ezekiel on the matter. So they come to you as people do and sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they do not do them, for, their, for with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well an instrument, for they hear your words, but they do not do them. And when this comes to pass, and surely it will, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. 
That's what Ezekiel had to say. Jesus actually tells us in Matthew 23, verses 1 to 5, that they were to do what the scribes and the Pharisees said to do, but not after the way that they do them. Listen to this. Then Jesus spoke to the multitude to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the garments, or the borders of their garments. You know, it's, it, 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 it's their hypocrisy that caused Christ to actually say such a ludicrous statement. Isn't it ridiculous to have to be told to obey the rulers, but don't do what they say, don't do it the way they do, don't do it? Isn't that ridiculous? They've betrayed their own trade. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. That's kind of what the scribes and the Pharisees would do, wouldn't it? Isn't it? Let's, let's look at the other half of our text at hand, the example that Christ gives of how Corbin is used. I'll reread those verses. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and he who curses father and mother, or father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, If a man says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, that is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition which you have handed down, and many such things you do. The idea of Corban might not seem too bad, actually, right? We're supposed to bring our offerings, right? We've got an offering box in the very back, don't we? we there's, it's, it's right to give to our Lord, but not with the motivation that they used to deliberately skirt the, the law of God. And that's what the problem is. It's a matter of the heart. It's our problem too. So how do we, how do we protect ourselves from these kind of things? What should we do, right? Right? Well, let me give you some verses to, to think about. And as we read these verses, I'll make some comments uh, of application. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Is your life one of rote practice or is it one of faith seeking him it's easy to fall into patterns of life I, I, I get it We're so, we, we, we kind of have our routines but don't let your Christian life turn into a routine life it should be the, the using a term that I'm not super familiar with, the very warp and wheel of what we are. It should be everything we are. It shouldn't be just relegated to, well, I'm a Christian because I have my devotions. Or I have, I'm a Christian because I say grace before dinner, right? Or I'm a Christian because I go to church every time there's a service, right? All of us say and do, think like that at times. But that's not why you're a Christian, folks. You're a Christian because you've been given faith, and we need to walk in that faith, how will they know? If it's just a matter of how you live, well, suddenly aren't we just doing uh, a certain thing and not actually living out our faith rightly? 
Let's not let our faith become, become or, or the joy of our Lord, I should say, become dull ritual and practice. Galatians 5.13 For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. You see, do you truly show love one to another? I saw some Facebook debate, and I never participate in them anymore, but every so often I'll read through a couple of them to kind of see what the tenor of something is going. And, of course, there was somebody that was arguing about, um, we're not, we don't have to keep the law anymore. And, you know, then they were saying, oh, but you, we do, we do, we don't, we don't. And it went back and forth, and they had all their examples and so on. But I don't think anybody has a problem with the idea that at the very least we need to show love one to another. That was the, the golden rule, as it were. James tells us, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by a law of liberty. Is your life of liberty true liberty? Or do you seek to flaunt a licentious lifestyle? I know most of us in this room, probably that's not our problem. We probably are on the other end. We probably end up flaunting a legalistic lifestyle. Right? Hopefully we're moving away from that a little bit. But you see, there, there's... the. There are two ends of this, you know, two ditches uh, on which we, we walk. And you, you, you walk too far to this side, you end up being legalistic. You walk too far to this side, you end up being licentious. Make Christ your goal and walk straight forward. And you don't have to worry so much about the ditches anymore, right? God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, do you look upon your Lord as a harsh taskmaster? How do you worship him? How can you worship him if all you do when you think of him is that you're condemned? Well, indeed, it would be a pretty hard thing. And really, that betrays... uh, kind of a, an attitude that is a, a completely a non-Christian attitude. Because we're, if we claim to be Christians, then we look upon our Lord as incredibly gracious. We just did the Lord's table today. And we were reminded of the grace that He has shown to us. He showed it to us while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Right? We must worship him in spirit and in truth. Not just the letter of the law, but in spirit too. But the letter matters, and and as much as lies in you, I hope you do seek to be obedient. In your zeal to obey, remember that he is tender-hearted. He's not going to let the smoking flax burn out. He knows the stuff of which we are made. See? Suddenly, if you think along those lines, God doesn't look like the harsh taskmaster, does he? That's my point. As we look upon him, so is he toward us. So this warning against hypocrisy points to a heart problem, a problem that we are prone to. It says, guard your heart, but guard it carefully. Proverbs 4.23 through 27 says this, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth, put perverse lips far from you, let your eyes look straight ahead, and, and your eyelids look right before you. 
Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. Now, I've wondered, as many of you have, and I've heard this actually at least three or four times in the last week, somebody asked me the question, you know, what's going to happen to our little church? Seems like we're just barely hanging on. Well, I can't tell you the future. I'm not Isaiah. Um, But what he says still stands. I can tell you that if we live hypocritical lives before the world or before one another or even just before our children, we are to be blamed. And the Lord would be just to take away the candle of our little church then. This isn't an arbitrary history lesson. It's a message for us. It's a message of warning, but it's also a chance. It's a chance to repent. No less than five times did Christ in parables say to uh, the Jews of his day, um, or I should say, no less than five times did Christ tell give parables to to the um, Jews of his day that they were going to be rejected and it was an opportunity for them to repent of that now praise God in the book of Acts we see that many of the priests became obedient to the faith so repentance was granted right repentance is always available that's the kind of God we serve one who loves us But here's some challenges that Christ gave to some other churches, and I want to give them to you so that you can think about them, okay? Because they could be, they could be the same challenge to us. You'll probably be familiar with some of these. To the church in Ephesus, he writes, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and that you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. I don't know if there's a church in Ephesus today. To Sardis, I know your works, that you have a name and that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain and that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Therefore, remember how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. To Laodicea is the last one. These things say the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I could wish you were hot or cold. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Jeremiah says, if you will return, O Israel, says the Lord, return to me. And if you will put away your abominations out of my sight, then you shall not be moved. And you shall swear the Lord lives in truth, judgment, and in righteousness. The nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him they shall glory. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground. And he says this to the men and women of Covenant Reformed Baptist Church. 
Break up your fallow ground and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Take away the foreskins of your heart. You men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, inhabitants of Covenant Reformed Baptist Church, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Honestly, this is a very hard message for me to preach. I don't want to come down like a hard-handed or heavy-handed preacher. But if we aren't willing to look at ourselves and, 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 and say, yeah, we've, we've got some failures here, then, then we're in danger. So we need, to, we need to be warned by that. And I hope that I've given you a tender side of our Lord that he does listen when we repent. Let's not live like hypocrites before the world. Let's give the world something to talk about that's worthy. Right? Amen. Let's go ahead and stand and I'll give the benediction it is found in 2 Corinthians 13, verses 14. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Go in peace.